So what we are saying is this is very achievable target to feed the world. You know, we are not we, we, we don't want two to three percent real growth in the world. If we have a technology that will give you two to three percent, the area will go out and the area can be go into natural habitat or other other productive use. But at the if we don't assume any kind of breakthrough in the technology, this is the real growth which, which will be required uh, to feed the world and keep rice price at affordable price. So that let me stop. I'm sorry for taking from this. Okay, thank you, Dr. Martin. Next, um, our la last and final speaker is uh, Mr. Vichai Siprasa, the founder and president of Riceland International. Um, he's in the business. It is a family business involvement in rice business started back in the 1930s and since its founding in 1977, Rice Land International has been exporting premium paraboy rice worldwide and is ranked a uh, top 5 paraboy rice exporter in Thailand. May I invite Mr. Siprasa to take the floor and um, to share his title of his talk on Thai rice market outlook. You have the floor. Thank you, uh, Dr. Tang. As you know, I'm a businessman and I often come to a conference like this to look at chart and statistics and I try to think about it, you know. What should I do? Should I buy today or should I not buy today? That's, that's what I normally do. And uh, when I do something wrong, I say, well, maybe professor didn't give me the proper guidance. <laughs> So I feel a little bit uh, better. But to, to tell you, there are so many things in here. If we were to use common sense, we would know that it's not, not possible to listen to any of the statistics. Why? Just look at the oil price. Uh, now today, our oil price is probably around what, $87 or so. And we learn that at this level, there will be competition for land, for water. Some of it will be diverted to go energy plant. Some of it for food. Now, when you compete between food and energy, is there any chance that food can command anything? The statistics that I learned from one of the conferences, I still remember, they say 100 kilos of corn can produce 100 liter of ethanol or something like that. And they say that 100 kilos of corn can feed a human being for a year. To my thinking, you feed your car, it lasts a couple of days for 100, 100 liters. Eh? The most you can use it for maybe two, three days. But for human being, it lasts you a year. Now, if that statistic is correct, there's no way that uh, food will prevail. All will be consumed by cars, <laughs> right? So prices cannot be stable like uh, Eric was suggesting that uh, projecting that the rice is going to be somewhere around $400 per ton. It's not possible because all the land and water will be taken away by energy plant. That's just common sense eh, to me, but I keep listening to each conference just to see how to make good use of the information that the experts have tried to collect. Just today, in Bangkok, the price of rice is somewhere around $500 plus or so. And in a few weeks, it moved from 400 something to 500 something. There is no major changes on the supply demand. Our production this year forecast to be a little bit more than last year. Let's say in the 450 tons new basis, more than a few years ago. And how could prices moving up $100 in, in, in a few weeks? Now that is beyond me because there's no relationship. Why would big supply mean unstable prices? And I look back this year, I saw prices in the United States at one time was lower than the Thai. <clears throat> perhaps $50, perhaps $100 lower. Can anybody confirm this or not? I'm sure 
is a hundred dollar difference. Eh? U.S. price most of the time is higher than the Thai price by fifty to hundred dollars, and the Thai prices are a hundred dollars higher than the Vietnamese price. But somehow this year, a few months ago, this relationship changed so much that we were we were above a hundred dollars above the Vietnamese, and the U.S. is a hundred dollars above Thai. And then in a few weeks, a few months, it changed. Changed to the, to the extent that the Thai price and Vietnamese price were at par. And the US price also at par. Now, nobody can explain that to me as to why it could be like that. It just, we just experienced this recently, the last few months. All of this experience tell me that the Chinese is much smarter than anybody. Thousands of years ago, they make a proverb. They say, even if you can become a saint, you cannot predict right prices. <laughs> you know? Hey, but I did predict <coughs> right prices well too. In 07, I think, in uh, Bali, uh, mm -hmm. I said, then the price was $300 something. And uh, I told the uh, the TV people who came to interview me. I said, no way to predict prices. But he said, ah, to be shy. You must know. You've been trading rice all your life. You must know. So tell me what, what, what you feel. I said, what I feel, it will go to a hundred, a thousand dollars. And the guy said, oh, from three hundred to a thousand? I said, yes, that's how I feel. And you know, Four months later, it hit a thousand dollars. I did not have any, what do they call uh, the word in English, whereby, you know, something uh, clairvoyance. Eh? I don't have that. You know, I don't have such a thing. But that's how I feel at that time. And they pressed forward, so I said a thousand dollars, and it did. It actually hit a thousand, a thousand something before it came down. Eh? And you know where I get that from? I got it from Erie. I used to visit Erie, and I bought the uh, Almanac, uh, the, the uh, statistical book. And the book showed me, in 1973-74, oil prices was very high, and so was rice prices. Rice prices were very high that year. And I saw the curve go like this and come down. And I saw. It used to be a thousand dollar nominal term or something. Then, so I remember that. And so people ask me, how do I feel? Because uh, in 07, oil prices were moving up very high. And so I said, we will see a thousand dollars. And we did. But now, having said that, did I benefit from it? No, I did not benefit from it. I did benefit on the way up, yes. But I believe in myself. I said, ah, Richard, you're smart now. You can predict prices. Because people were talking, you know, the substitute, you know, like an energy plan. Not enough land, not enough water, so right time to continue to go up. And I believe <coughs> it. Oh my goodness. When it hit a thousand and came down, it came all the way down to four hundred dollars. You know, and I lost my shirt. <laughs> because I believe that I have the ability to predict. Actually, nobody has the ability to predict. Not possible to predict right prices, just like the Chinese proverb say. So we learn to be humble now. We don't we don't take anybody words easily. Whether the price gonna go up or go down, we learn to be very cautious. To lose a little or to win a little is better. Just gap yeah, is better. Not not a big not out. Eh? Anyway, so that's what I learned to survive by not believing in any statistic suggesting any direction, but try to do day by day and to survive. Now that comes to another topic that I'd like to share with you. Thailand has been champion for a long, long time. We have uh, managed to uh, have big surpluses and we export the largest amount in the world today for many decades running. And people will ask me, could we try in 2020 or 2035, you think Thailand would continue to be like this? And I would say, hell no. Definitely not. Why? I can see that the, uh, the environment that we survive in Thailand is not conducive <laughs> to
to growth, particularly the government policy. You know, Thai government have changed. Way back, we were ruled by the king, and then our, at about 1930 or so, we changed to some form of democracy. Democratic form of government means that you try to listen to the mass poor, to the majority of the people, as particularly the poor. Now, if you listen to the poor, then you will adopt one policy. If you listen to the rich, you believe you adopt another policy. Rice is a commodity, people say, political commodity. That means politicians are interested in it. And they use rice as a means to stay in power, to get voted in, to rule the country, and to stay. So now, I pay a lot more attention to what each government of each country is likely to do with their right policy. Now, in Thailand, way back 150 years ago, our learned King Rama IV opened the rice market to the British, you know, free trade. And uh, my ancestors, my great-great-grandfather, heard about it in China. They said, ah, let's go to Thailand, let's do some business. And a lot of Chinese folk moved in to Thailand. And some of them also came to Vietnam, because the French also was doing some kind of free trade in rice. So some Chinese came to Vietnam, some went to Thailand, and some Indian folks went to Burma. You know, these are the entrepreneurs that like to do the buying and selling. And if you have a policy that can attract this group of people, they will work, they will sweat, and they will develop the rice economy for you. Now, in Asia, this is what happened uh, because of the Chinese that immigrated. But in Africa, I keep watching whether when would they do that in Africa. If the Chinese ever move into Africa, West Africa or South Africa, the same thing will happen again in African continent. But if they don't go, forget it. It will not work. You know, you can have scientific contribution, this and that. Without the working ends, it will not work. But watch it, you know. It's going to happen in our lifetime. We're going to see the thing going to shift to Africa. If you see more Thai, the Chinese or Vietnamese move in to Africa, the whole world will change, the rice world will change. Now Thailand, would, we will not be able to supply anything, big number, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, because the government is not thinking in that direction. I think uh, somebody this morning said, who was it, uh, was it, uh, was it Pink, Pink Ali, uh, Dr. Pink Ali said, that in his book, Rice Bowl, he said he studied then, and Asian government were complacent. And I said exactly the same, that applicable to Thai government, complacent. So what we are, the largest rice exporter, what do we have to do more? Already the champion. So they are not interested to do anything more for growth. Actually, they want to limit it. They don't want the rice will grow more and more. They want to limit it less and less. You know why? When they go to the, go, the <laughs> politician go to visit in the countryside, they ask Kulung, uh, which means uncle in Thailand, we respect all the people, say, Kulung, what do you want? Kulung farmer will tell the politician, give me high price, high price of paddy. Oh, politician say, okay. I go back, I can think of a way how to make sure that you get high prices of paddy. And you know, most of the politicians in Thailand for decades now don't feel a thing when they meddle with the market pricing. They don't, they don't think the market prices is something you cannot touch. You know, the lady that asked, you asked whether high price is good or bad or low price is good. And this is exactly the same story. Politicians say, ah, you people want high price, I'm going to do it for you. <laughs> so price support came to Thailand, you know, mortgage the rice and this and that, set the price way above the market. Mm -hmm. 